Let me just say a couple of words in closing. Um, what we are being subjected to this week by the Electric Power Research Institute is, I believe, as these very distinguished experts can attest, misleading at best, dishonest at worst, and a formula for further inaction in dealing with this threat, especially if, as seems absolutely predictable on the basis of the past track record, the electric utilities that underwrite this entity's work, reference was made to the folks who brought you thank you for smoking, it's a similar kind of deal. It is not an independent, objective, and frankly honest arbiter of what the problem is here. But the people who are bringing you this study will be cited, you can be sure, if this evidence that we're laying out for you today is not heeded as evidence that the utilities don't need to worry about this problem, as they do not want to. And for that matter, there will be government bureaucrats who have been working with them over many years to try to ensure that nothing is done about this vulnerability, hard as that is to believe, who will also seize upon this EPRI study and say, well, you see, no, no matter what the president has directed a month ago, in terms of the dangers that EMP represents and the necessity of the government pulling together to correct our present vulnerabilities. They will say, we don't need to go along with that. We can continue to at least slow it down, if not sabotage any effort to protect the grid. This must not be allowed to happen. I'm very appreciative that uh, General Quast is not only here, but is working tirelessly to try to make sure that the science drives the kinds of decisions that will be made pursuant to the president's direction. And I just wanted to make sure everyone had a copy. We'll have it up at the securethegrid.com website shortly of a very short critique and analysis of what we know about this study. Uh, by the end of this week, I'm quite certain that the Electromagnetic Defense Task Force will have really wrung it out. And as a result, we'll have an even more authoritative rebuttal to junk science and hopefully a corrective that will enable us to get on with the job of protecting our people. Uh, with that, we'll be happy to take questions. If you have any for specific individuals, please identify them and also please identify yourselves. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Pry. What is the total estimate? Identify yourself, please, States, sir, if you would. Her household. And is it feasible for the state to take this one? Would you identify yourself, please? Thank you. Peter? Well, the estimated costs vary. You know, it depends upon what kind of a program you want. I think the most authoritative estimate is from the Congressional EMP Commission, which back in 2008 uh, estimated that to protect the uh, bulk power system, the electric grid, uh, would cost about 2 to $3 billion back in 2008 maybe three to four billion dollars today. And that's basically what we used to give away in foreign aid to Pakistan every year until President Trump widely uh, discontinued that, problem, that, that, that foreign aid. So if we had spent, taken the foreign aid to Pakistan for one year and spent it on the security of the American people, the most significant aspect of this threat, the threat to the electric grid, would already have been solved. Yes, please. When Peter talked about the bulk power grid, he's talking about the generation and the transmission of electricity that is bought then by cooperatives and utility companies. I don't know about in Alabama, but in South Carolina where we're working this problem, there's about 40 such companies. And they're the ones who deliver electricity to your hospitals, to your water, wastewater, to your homes, to your businesses, and so on. And when we started working this problem in South Carolina, I discovered that they were not talking to Duke Energy, which I'm satisfied wants to work this problem. And therefore, they were not connected to Duke generation um, elements that are in York County, in the very same county, uh, simply because they were not talking. And so we have a problem that really is a bottom-up problem in this country, in addition to working the bulk power problem. 
And since you ask about costs, we've gone through and done an estimate of what we think it will cost to the citizens of York County to harden the distribution grid. And it's a one-time installation cost of like $100 per citizen, okay? Now, if you don't take insurance, at least last year, medical insurance, they charge you something like $900 for not taking medical insurance a month. So can we afford this? You know, this is nonsense. This really is nonsense, folks. I shouldn't uh, give this uh, total because I worked it out one time and I don't uh, have it with me. The other end. And I don't have it with me. But um, um, if you are in the habit of uh, drinking a Vente uh, mocha latte uh, every morning, and you are willing to cut back to just a plain cup of coffee. Um, the 350 million Americans, more or less, most of many of whom drink coffee, uh, basically pay for uh, what uh, you need to undertake. We are not talking about a huge expenditure uh, uh, for this at all. Just one other data point, if you're interested in this, um, a group that we work with called Protect Our Power has done some public opinion survey work to evaluate public attitudes on precisely this question. What would you be willing to spend over and above what you're currently paying in terms of your electricity rates to ensure that you continue to have electricity and therefore that you can survive? And not surprisingly, most Americans were very supportive of this. I don't have the specific data at my hands, but what they found was that if you asked, would you be willing to pay $5 more a month, there was a strong plurality. If you said $2 a month, it became a majority. If you said $1 more a month, it was a very, very large majority. The American people, frankly, expect us to be doing this. And the only reason that this continues to persist in terms of a public policy nightmare is because they generally don't know. So we're very grateful to those of you who are here who will help us share this word, as well as, of course, the work that the Electromagnetic Defense Task Force is doing. General, would you like to say anything further? Are there other questions for the team? Anybody else? Going, going, gone. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, sorry, I missed one. Apologize. A petition would be a good idea. We will talk with uh, our friends at Eagle Forum and see what we can do on it. Thank you for the suggestion. Anybody else? Can yes, sir. Somebody address how we get the public utilities uh, to get their money back if they do this. <coughs> Well, there are a few people who've given some thought to that. Tom, do you want to address that? This is one of the most critical questions for EMP protection. How do the utilities recover their costs? It's especially a concern for uh, generation plants because in about two-thirds of the United States, the generation plants sell their electricity in a competitive market, and there is no ready mechanism for them to recover their costs. They unfortunately have a tendency to oppose uh, some of these protections. And it's not just EMP security protections, but it's other protections as well. You can even see, uh, you're, you will see in this EPRI report that the EMP vulnerability of generation plants was completely left out of the report. Uh, in the other third of the United States, uh, there are regulated uh, electricity, uh, regulated utilities. Uh, and those utilities also have difficulty uh, in going in front of the PUCs, the Public Utility Commissions, because the Public Utility Commissions often don't have sufficient recognition of the EMP threat. That's why this kind of forum is so critically important to inform not only the public, but the Public Utility Commissions about the gravity of this threat and how it needs to be addressed. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Just one more comment. How many of you know who Senator Ron Johnson is? Anybody? He chairs the Senate Oversight Committee on Homeland Security. He cares about this problem. And so when you think about petitions and all the rest, you might put on your list to 
to tell your senators to talk to Johnson about this. I spoke to him some time ago about the cost issue because he's a businessman. I don't know whether he's going to stay beyond this term, in fact. He, he doesn't like Washington any more than I. He thinks the place is dysfunctional. Uh, and he said to me, I told him, uh, we're getting close. He said, you tell me what you think it will cost, and if you can defend your cost estimates, I will lead the fight in the United States Senate to get the feds to pay for at least their fair share of this problem. So there are people in Washington who will stand up and stand with you, and he's a guy I'd point to who can lead the, the band. Your chairman of the Appropriations Committee is not a bad place to start either. Shelby, I'm talking to Senator Shelby. Peter Pratt. Russia and China are the only nations in the world that have protected their populations and their military forces from a nuclear EMP attack. We've protected some of our military forces, but our civilian critical infrastructures that support the lives of 326 million Americans are unprotected. And we don't know how to keep alive 326 million people, million people for a year with no food and water. You know, this is a problem that the Department of Defense has known about, you know, for decades, but it was deeply classified. Only until two, in 2008 was, with the EMP Commission reports, has a lot of this become unclassified and have we started and been trying all this time to try to get the civilian critical infrastructures protected. Now we finally have a president who's had the courage and the vision to step up and do an EMP executive order and to put out a, a report, as EPRI has, that tries to defeat the purpose of that executive order is dangerously irresponsible. They're carrying water for the Russians, the North, the Chinese, the Iranians, and the North Koreans, all who have threatened and laid plans for EMP attack against the United States. I just want to make one quick point on that subject. Um, as General Quast and Commander Hubbard know, the military, as Peter and others have said, has spent considerable amount of effort and time trying to protect key elements of its forces, specifically its strategic nuclear forces. And yet the United States military, based here in the continental United States, is almost entirely dependent for its mission readiness on the civilian grid as well. So this is one of these cases where we are not simply talking about the nation being vulnerable, we're also talking about our defensive capabilities also being potentially at risk. And this is why, as Peter has just said, every bad guy on the planet has been studying what they can do to take down our grid with catastrophic effect. Make no mistake about it. I do want to close if uh, there aren't any other questions. Yes, sir. How close do they have to be? To initiate one of these nuclear strikes. Anybody want to take that? Five thousand miles. Peter Fry? Well, actually, there's a potential threat flying over our head several times a day. North Korea has got two satellites orbiting over the United States, KMS-3 and KMS-4. We don't know whether they're nuclear armed or not, but the EMP Commission was sufficiently concerned because of the trajectory of these satellites and because of their mysterious purpose uh, that they might be nuclear armed for a surprise EMP attack. Those satellites pass right overhead and are uh, regularly centered over the center of the United States in the optimum location. You could also do an EMP attack off a freighter. Uh, the North Koreans and the Iranians have both practiced that scenario and that would keep your fingerprints off the attack. That's one of the other dangerous things about EMP. You can do the attack anonymously. You know, it takes down radars and satellites that are necessary to identify who attacked you. And that makes it a great temptation to all the bad guys in the world, you know, because deterrence may not work against them. You know, we may not know who attacked us if you do an EMP attack. And in fact, uh, when, if we get to a situation where Iran gets nuclear weapons, as it may well already have them, according to some experts, you know, we're going to face a false flag kind of a situation. The Iranians would love for us to think that the Russians made an EMP attack against us so that the great superpowers the great infidel powers would wipe each other out. This is a much more dangerous, much more complicated kind of a scenario we're engaged in where traditional deterrence theory that worked during the Cold War 
probably isn't going to work in the future when you have multiple nuclear actors and the possibility of doing an EMP attack that would enable you with one weapon to win a war. I just want to stress one thing that Peter uh, made quite clear, but there's one aspect of it that I think is really important. If you read the papers and listen to the press or the distant television about these issues, it sounds as if what really, really matters is range and accuracy for a ballistic missile. And once you have something with a lot of range that could reach the United States, once you have something that's accurate to within a few hundred yards, let's say, that's the problem. No. That's something that you'd pay attention to if you were launching an intercontinental ballistic missile from North Korea all the way over the pole to hit Washington, D.C. And, and you care about the accuracy and you care about the range. For EMP, you don't care about either one. All you have to do is launch it on a, a essentially a northern axis trajectory, and it keeps passing over pretty much any single spot on the Earth a couple of times a day. And it's being boosted into orbit as a satellite, not as a missile to launch at a target. So there's nothing easier, really. The first thing that was ever done in space was the Russians put Sputnik up in 1957. All they would have had to do then was put a nuclear weapon inside Sputnik and detonate it when it passed over the United States. So if you have a country that has nuclear weapons and that has, um, has a ballistic missile program that can launch something up a short distance, 20, 30 miles into orbit, you've got what you need. Pakistan could launch today against the United States uh, on a, 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 a system that would be designed essentially to become an orbiting satellite and deliver an EMP belt blast. Peter Pry and Jim Woolsey have written several important articles about this particular problem of the satellites and have concluded that the satellites that the North Koreans are orbiting right now could conceivably accommodate a super electromagnetic pulse weapon, which we no, thanks to the work of the EMP Threat Commission, the Russians gave the North Koreans the design for it. So we're going to conclude with this. I did want to just have Peter Pry tell you one last anecdote about a conversation that he had with a man who wasn't even at the time yet a candidate for the presidency, let alone president of the United States. But I think it's an appropriate basis upon which to, to leave this. Peter Pry, would you talk about your conversation with Donald Trump? Sure. Thank you, Frank. And you made that conversation possible by setting it up so that I could brief uh, then-candidate Trump on the EMP threat when he was uh, first running for president in Iowa. And after the conversation, uh, he was appalled that this problem had not yet, but yet been solved, that the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, and the Department of Homeland Security were not working together to protect the American people and our civilization from this existential threat. And he said to me, you know, don't worry. When I'm elected president, we'll knock their heads together and solve this problem. And basically, that's what his executive order does. The executive order compels, for the first time, the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Energy, all the relevant departments and agencies to work together to take part responsibility. All of them have part of this problem and to work together to solve the problem. And he doesn't give them forever to do it. You know, they've got one year from the date that that executive order was signed. Next March 26th of next year, they're, they're all on the hook to make giant steps forward in terms of recommendations about how to get the country protected. So we're on a fast track to get this problem solved. The Electric Power Research Institute and the other electric power lobbies that don't want us to solve this problem, get out of the way. Get off the tracks and get out of the way of the train. You know, the, pres the president, the decision has been made to protect this country. We need to protect it. And it is not helpful to have the electric power lobbyists trying to stop the train from going forward. With that, thank you very much for being here. I want to say a special word of thanks to General Quas, not only for being here and helping get us all here, but standing in the sun all this time. It's appreciated. And thank you to all of you for being here as well. God bless you. And let's see if we can't uh, get America protected against electromagnetic pulse. Thank you.